we continue in our series that we started a few weeks back uh, through the book of Psalms. As I've mentioned, there's 150 Psalms, and we didn't want to cover every one of them. We'd be at this for three years. So instead, we're choosing about 12, and uh, this morning we are going to be, excuse me, <clears throat> we are going to be in Psalm 34. The message this morning is titled Decision Time. And again, Psalm 34, it's one of David's psalms, and this is the sixth in our series that we call Songs We Need to Sing, Discovering the Hope of God in the Book of Psalms. I need to ask a question that I think everyone would probably answer the same way. Have you ever really made a dumb decision in your life? That's what I thought. I didn't hear anyone shout, no! Once? Twice? Okay. We've made some dumb decisions. We can make some childish decisions as we're growing up. What's worse is when we make childish decisions as adults. But we make dumb decisions that sometimes there are consequences for. David certainly made some really dumb decisions. Here was this man after God's own heart. This man who was a, a, a valiant soldier and warrior. Here was a man who was a musician who wrote all these beautiful psalms and poems and songs to God. And here was a man who made a bunch of dumb decisions. In Psalm 34, we see David reflecting on one of those low points in his life. What's neat about the book of Psalms? If you've got your Bibles and open them up, or if you have a Bible app, I want you to look at Psalm 34. Because what's neat is that quite often you will see a preface. Before you get to the first verse of a particular psalm, there's an introduction. And here in Psalm 34, the introduction says of David when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech who drove him away and he left. Wow, doesn't that make you want to find out a little bit more? David feigned insanity? He pretended to be nuts? Why did he do it? Well, we're going to dig into that just a little bit before we get into the psalm itself because it helps us appreciate the psalm. It's written there so that we can understand the circumstances and why David wrote the things he wrote, why he realized he needed to praise the Lord. A psalm of David when he pretended madness before Abimelech who drove him away and he left. He vamoosed. He took off. What's the situation? David's low point started after one of the highest points of his young life. David killed Goliath. We know that story, don't we? Only a boy named David, only a little sling. We know that story about David taking five smooth stones from the creek bed and using just one, the first one, to bring Goliath down. Uh, the Goliath was, a, was an enemy. He was of the Philistine army. He was their mighty warrior. We, we are told that he actually was a giant compared to the size of the others. Now, I don't know if Goliath was a whole lot taller than some of our seven-foot-plus NBA basketball players we see and regularly cheer for, but he was a giant of a man, and he was terrorizing the Jewish army, and they cowered before him. And here came, came David from the fields, from shepherding his father's flocks, bringing food to his brothers who were fighting in King Saul's army, and he found out that this one Philistine was not only shaming the army of Israel, but he was blaspheming God. And David would have none of it, and he took him down. Now, the slaying of Goliath spelled trouble for David. It spelled triumph as well. The triumph we think about, the triumph we celebrate. It turns out that that began David's warrior years. He became one of the most, uh, one of the bravest of all of King Saul's soldiers. And David was victorious in all the battles. In fact, the women of Israel started singing songs about David. And here's what they said. They said, Saul, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands. And guess what happened? Saul got jealous. Saul really got irritated. And he began with his jealousy of David, a campaign of persecution that lasted all the way to Saul's death. Saul wanted David dead. 
First Saul eyed David with a resentful and envious eye. And then twice he threw javelins at David. He plotted against David. He sent a gang of bullies to murder David while he was asleep in his bed. And he hounded David all over the country. David had to run for his life. And so it went until David, for all the trust he had in God, became tired and weary of this deadly game of hide and seek between himself and King Saul, a king he still honored because he was still the king of Israel. And at last, David's faith slipped. He went to the priest at the tabernacle, and he told the priest four different lies in a single breath. He conned the priest into giving him and his men the showbread. This was fresh bread that was left as an offering to God. And the only ones that were to consume it were the priests and their families. But yet David convinced the priest to feed his own army that was defending him. He also said, the sword of Goliath is in your possession. Please let me have it. And he was able to convince the priest to give David Goliath's sword. And then David made a decision. He decided he would go where Saul would never find him. Where would he go? He went to Gath, the hometown of Goliath. He went to Gath, the place that was central to the enemies of Israel, to the Philistines. And when he came to Gath, the Philistines recognized who he was, and they immediately told their king, Abimelech. Abimelech had him arrested. Abimelech had him brought into his own palace. And David, knowing that his life was at stake, then pulled one of the biggest con jobs of his life. He started babbling. He started drooling. He started looking and acting and speaking and smelling like he was insane. And when Abimelech took a look at this man he thought was his mortal enemy, this man who he thought was such a mighty warrior, just simply drooling all over himself, he said, why did you bring this crazy man into my home? Get him out of here. And when David was released, he ran to a cave and he hid. Now, that's the circumstances of this psalm. That's what those few lines at the beginning of Psalm 34 are telling us. Psalm 34 is a song of David when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he left. 1 Samuel 21 tells us that David pretended to lose his mind, but Psalm 34 tells us that David repented and decided to come back to God. And as David wrote these words, he was writing from a new perspective. He was reviewing what he had done. And he was saying, God, I need to turn back to you. I need to decide to follow you. So Psalm 34 is about commitment. It's commitment to do the right thing. It's commitment to make the right decisions. And it wasn't just about David's commitment. Psalm 34 is about our commitment. We see in verses 1 through 7, we need to commit to ourselves to exalt God. It's time. To exalt God. As a matter of fact, it's always time to exalt God. There's always time to praise the Lord. As David said in verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. That was David's commitment. His renewed commitment. And you know what? He needed to say that because there were times in his life he didn't feel like praising God. Have you ever had times in your life when the burden has been so heavy, when the questions have been so serious that you've wondered, can I praise you, God? Can I lift up your name? I'm in a mess. David understood that. And he realized that God was worthy of his praise even when he didn't feel like praising God. And guess what, folks? God is worthy of our praise even when we feel like we don't want to give him any. We need to notice that David made his commitment to exalt the Lord because he knew that praise would be contagious. Have you ever been involved in a worship service, much like we did this morning, where the songs become contagious, where we start singing and it starts to change our attitudes and our hearts and even our demeanors? David knew that. 
He said in verse 2, My soul shall make its boast to the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. As I praise God, others will turn to God. It's contagious. Praise is contagious. And so is gossip, and so is complaining, and so is cursing, and so is all the other things that we see people doing these days. But if we are praising God, it can overcome those negatives. And David calls on us to join him in verse 3. He said, Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. And then in verses 4 through 7, David gives a few of the causes, a few of the reasons for our praise. A few of the reasons why every believer, every believer, no matter the circumstances, should exalt the Lord. He said this. He said, I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him from all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around all those who fear him, and he delivers them for these reasons then. For these reasons, and for countless more, we should all be praising the Lord at all times. Will we do it? It's time for us to exalt the Lord. But secondly, it's time for us to experience God. That's what verse 8 says. This is exactly what David calls us to do. This is what we sang about just a few minutes ago. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. This call to taste and see reminds us that salvation is much more than simply trying to keep the rules. Salvation is much more than simply going through religious rituals. Salvation is a personal relationship with God that we receive when we trust in and obey the Lord Jesus Christ. When we come into a relationship with Him. I, I, how many of you... Uh, no Dorothy Cash. Anyone here know Dorothy Cash? Has anyone here ever met Dorothy Cash? I can tell you right now the answer is no. Because Dorothy Cash was my mother, and she died eight years before Kalita and I ever came to Michigan, before we ever moved to Sault Ste. Marie. She's been gone 18 years now. I've talked about my mom. I've written about my mom. And because of the stories I have told about my mom, some of you might feel that you know her a little bit. But as much as you might relate to my mother through the stories I have told, there were only two people in this building and only two people in all of Sault Ste. Marie that know Dorothy Cash. Her daughter-in-law, Kalita Cash, and her son, Tom Cash. And no matter how much you might have heard about my mom from me or from others, no matter how, uh, what you have believed about my mom, you still did not know her in the personal way that Kalita and I knew her. We didn't just know about Dorothy Cash. We knew Dorothy Cash. We experienced Dorothy Cash. And we had a relationship with Dorothy Cash. She was my mom. And I was her son. She was Kalita's mother-in-law. And Kalita was her daughter-in-law. And that personal relationship made all the difference. You know what? God the Father wants to have a personal relationship with us. It's not good enough to know about God. It's not good enough to read the stories of God. We need to know Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the very heart of Christianity. This is the reason we have a faith that we have. To be saved is to know God in a personal way. To have a personal relationship with the Lord. It is the most important experience any of us could ever have. Making a decision to follow and obey Jesus Christ is more important than what we do as, uh, uh, for a career. It's more important than what we decide to do as far as who to marry and when to marry. It's more important than anything else we might decide to do. And this is why David declares, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. 
Blessed is the one who trusts in him. Folks, it's time to experience God. Let's quit talking about him. Let's quit mumbling a song of praise and not be thinking about the words and how they affect our hearts. Let's experience our Lord. And let's make it real. Thirdly, it's time to excel in our godly living. If we are going to experience God, he is going to change the way we live. Verses 9 through 14, David calls us to a life of holy reverence before God. Look at verses 9 and 10. Verses 9 and 10 say, Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no one, uh, there, I'm sorry, there is no want or no need for those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. And then going on to verse, uh, to verse 11, David said, Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What David is saying is we need to have a reverence for God, and we need to teach others to have that same holy, reverent fear for the Lord. Now, Bruce Howell, who is a Bible scholar, helps us understand what fear is about. We sang about it in that last song before the communion time. How that we should fear the Lord. But fear in the Bible means to tremble. And it's used in connection with three different experiences we have in our lives. To tremble with the thought of being punished by a holy God for our sins. And that's the kind of fear we most often think about. When someone says, fear God, we think, okay, God's got his thumb on us and he's going to crush us. We better fear him. But there's two more important views of what it means to fear the Lord. To tremble at the sight of the mighty acts of God. Have you ever been overwhelmed when you realize something happened in your life and it absolutely, no doubt in your mind, it was a God thing? It could not have happened except that God brought it about. That's giving us godly fear for the mighty acts of God. And then we tremble with joy. With joy, with pleasure, with celebration at the knowledge that people are being saved. That's who God is. And that's why we fear him. Our nation desperately needs more respect and more reverence for God. But guess what? They will not have respect and reverence for God until God's people have respect and reverence for him. Until God's people exhibit the holy fear of God. Fear is something, for, fear for God is something we must learn. And in verses 11 through 14, David says it's something we must live by. He said, come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the one who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. How urgently our country in 2020 needs to hear these words. How desperately our country needs to see followers of the Lord Jesus Christ living by these words. Can I read them again? Depart from evil, do good, seek peace, pursue it. You know, when you battle with someone else because of politics, we need to make sure as Christians we are departing from evil and that we are doing good, that we are seeking peace and we are pursuing it. When you battle with someone because your views of the, of the coronavirus and the shutdowns and everything else going on are causing you to lose friends and even lose loved ones as friends, are we departing from evil? Are we doing good? Are we seeking peace? And are we pursuing it? This country, this state, this city, this church, and our own family members need to see followers of God living by these words. It's time to excel in godly living. Fourth, it's time to examine God's justice. 
in verses 15 through 21. If you look at all the evil, and if you look at all the pain of the world, you're just looking at the success of wicked people. And you get the idea that, God, you've walked off the job. I thought you were supposed to, to bring about good. I thought there was supposed to be victory and peace. How many times have people asked this same question? If there is a loving God, then why is there so much evil and suffering in the world? How many times has that passed through our own minds over the years? We must not lose sight of the truth that God is a just God and that his judgment is coming on the world. There will be a time of accountability. And so David helps us understand that in verses 15 through 21. This is the longest part of this scripture passage we're looking at. David said, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. He saves such as have a contrite heart. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them from them all. He guards all his bones, and not one of them will be broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. We need to never forget that God is just. And we need to always remember that his judgment is coming to the world. Thomas Jefferson, one of our founding fathers, one of our first presidents, said it well. He said, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and his justice cannot sleep forever. It's time for us to examine God's justice in our own lives and how that reflects to a world that is desperate to know of God. But finally, it is time to explain God's salvation. Now, I'm looking at verse 22, the last verse of this psalm, but we need to back up a little bit so we can see what David is saying and where he's coming from. In verses 18 through 22, David explained a lot about God's salvation. First, in verse 18, David said, The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart or a contrite heart. He saves those who have a broken or contrite spirit. Now, what does it mean to have a contrite spirit? It sounds like something we need to know. We just can't gloss over that. The word picture here is something that's crushed and ground even down to powder. Not just broken, but ground down to powder. And the scripture always links salvation to, the, to conviction. The scripture always links salvation to repentance, to being broken by our own sin and realizing we need someone to save us. And that one who saves us is our Lord Jesus Christ. In verses 19 through 20, David went on to say, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. He guards all of his bones and not one of them will be broken. Now isn't that an interesting promise? But that is actually a prophecy of Christ. Remember a few weeks ago we spent time in Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They wag their heads at me. He can't save himself. They gamble for my clothing. I am pierced. All those scenes from the crucifixion were predicted and spoken of by David. And now David says, not one bone's going to be broken. Well, here's the story. To speed up the crucifixion, of three men outside of Jerusalem before the Passover celebration, the Jewish leaders asked the Roman authorities to break the men's legs. And when you're hanging on a cross, and the only source of your strength to be able to breathe is to raise yourself up through the nail-pierced feet and catch your breath and then let yourself down again, breaking the legs causes immediate asph asphyxiation. You suffocate. You drown in your own blood. That's what happens when they break the legs of a man being crucified. And so there was one man on the right, they broke his legs and he died. There was one man on the left, they broke his legs and he died. They came to the man hanging on the center cross and they saw that he was not breathing. Every aspect looked like he had already passed, which was unusual because crucifixion sometimes can take days. And so rather than breaking his legs, 
one of the soldiers thrust a spear under his ribs straight into his heart to see if he was dead. Well, guess what, folks? If he wasn't, he was then. But blood and water flowed out together, and that told them from a medical perspective, especially from Dr. Luke writing the account in his gospel, that Jesus had already died, and they didn't break his bones. And so we're told in John 19, verse 36, these things were done that the scriptures would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. David explained God's salvation for us. In verse 22, in the last verse of this passage, of this chapter, of this beautiful psalm, this psalm of repentance, David said, the Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. The Lord redeems. He pays for, he buys back the souls of those who trust in him. That's why 1 Peter chapter 1 tells Christians, you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. But you were redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, a lamb without blemish and without spot. We have been redeemed. We need to explain that redemption. We need to take on that redemption. We need to have that personal relationship that allows that redemption to grow in our hearts. And we need to thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ that frees us all. There was a former slave trader back in Great Britain by the name of John Newton. Does the name ring a bell? He also wrote some, some hymns. One of John Newton's hymns is entitled Amazing Grace that saved a wretch like me. Looking back on his life, he realized who he was apart from Christ. He realized the evil he had done as in, in, in being a slave trader. I once was lost, but I'm now found. I was blind, now I see. But Newton also wrote these words to another hymn that we don't hear very often these days. And the hymn's called Saved by Grace. And here's what he said. Saved by grace, I live to tell what the love of Christ hath done. He redeemed my soul from hell of a rebel made a son. Oh, I tremble still to think how secure I lived in sin, sporting on destruction's brink, yet was saved from falling in. Goes right along with amazing grace that saved a wretch like you and like me, because people desperately need to know it's time, it is past time for the church, for us as individual believers to exclaim God's truth and to do it in love. It's decision time. David came to these decisions after he really made some boneheaded mistakes. It's decision time for us. It's time for us, with all the dumb things we've done, with all of the things that we actually are absolutely ashamed of, it's time to realize we can't get that blotch off of our record. But Jesus' blood can wash it white as snow. It's time. And it's time to share that kind of hope with a world that is racked with anger, with greed, with uncertainty, with suspicion. It's time. It's our decision time to make Jesus our Lord and to surrender ourselves to the one who saves wretches, worms like us and makes us into God's children. What a transformation. You need that. I need that. And as we, we who belong to Christ have that, we need to share it with a world that is going to hell without Jesus Christ. We can make a difference only if we decide to follow. So we invite you to decide today.
If you're outside of Christ, you can come forward on this invitation. And you can let, us, let me know where you're at, what you need. We'll find out. We'll talk to you. We'll look at the scriptures. And we'll show you what the Lord says. If you're already a believer, you've already been baptized, you've walked with him for a number of years, but you've goofed up like David has. It's time to repent and to realize that you can come home and then you can proclaim Jesus. What are you ready for? What are you waiting for? It's time. Let's stand and let's sing. And if you need to make a decision, you can come forward this morning.